I was an orphan. I was an orphan lost at the fall, running away when I'd hear you call. The father you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near you though. But Father, you love me still. And in love before you laid the world's foundation, you predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me up so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. You left. You left your home to seek out the lost. You knew the great and terrible cost. But Jesus, your face was dead. I worked my fingers down to the bone. But nothing I did could ever atone. But Jesus, you paid my debt. By your blood, I have redemption and salvation. Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown. You have rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. The Spirit, you made me see. I swore I knew the way on my own A head full of rocks, a heart made of stone But Spirit, you moved in me, yeah And at your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened On my darkened heart, the light of Christ that shone I called it to a kingdom that could not be shaken Heaven citizen by grace and grace alone. So I'll stand. So I stand and faith by grace and grace alone. I will swim the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. So today's scripture is taken from Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 to 42, and it reads, Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill it to the Lord, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool. Or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You have heard it, that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. My name is Neil, and uh, I'm preaching today, and we're all sort of mesmerized by the magic wall. <laughs> what the heck? Is it going to do some more stuff? Yeah, we're, good. we're good. Okay. Hey, um, it's a privilege to, to be part of this message series on 
the Sermon on the Mount. Now, some of you are familiar with a, a so-called form of humor uh, called dad jokes, yeah? So my dad was a preacher. So there's a subcategory called preacher dad jokes. And I know uh, my dad used to love to, and he was his own best um, audience. Because halfway through a joke, he'd start laughing because he'd crack himself up. I think that's maybe what dads do, maybe, too. So he'd always, uh, so for example, on this, he'd say, um, did you know that there's baseball in the Bible? You no. Know, the Sermon on the Mound. And then he'd chuckle, you know. And, and it, he, he had all these uh, preacher dad jokes. How about, um, did you know there's uh, tennis in the Bible? So Joseph served in Pharaoh's court. Ha, <laughs> ha. Tough crowd. Yeah, they're not that funny, though. How, how about, um, how about uh, motorcycles in the Bible? J Joshua's triumph was heard all over Israel. And, and uh, there's marital discord in the Bible. Do you know that? It said, Mary rode Joseph's ass all the way to Be Bethlehem. <laughs> Actually, that's my wife's joke. So that... Hey, um, enough dad jokes. Preacher dad jokes. This is an extraordinary uh, passage. Like, I've been reading this, uh, these three chapters for the last couple of weeks, and I really recommend it. This is like the heart of what Jesus is about. Uh, the kingdom that he came to bring is described in these three chapters. If you only could take three chapters out of the Bible, if somebody said, I'm taking your whole Bible away for three chapters, you should think about keeping these three. They really... They're, they're what Jesus is most about. Now, I wanna, before I dive into what I'm supposed to teach today, uh, I just want to do a little bit of uh, context work. So it says in the, the first verse of chapter 5, he saw the crowds and he began to teach them. Now you go, okay, blah, 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 we're going to get on to the stuff. But I just want to pause there for a minute. Jesus was teaching all these just regular people. Let me tell you a little bit. So if you were a Hebrew um, child growing up in, in that time, uh, You'd start school when you're six years old uh, at a school called Bet Sefer. I think, are we uh, putting that up there? It means uh, house of the book. And you know what you would do for four years? You would memorize the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Not read the Torah. You would memorize it. You got that? Unbelievable. And then at uh, 11, uh, when you're finished uh, Bet Sefer, then you'd go to Bet Talmud, which is the house of learning, and you would memorize the rest of the Old Testament. Memorize it. And you go, wow, you know, nobody could do that anymore. But Cheryl and I went to a concert a little while ago, and we watched everybody around us sing every word. <laughs> I mean, people, we still memorize a lot of stuff, don't we? But these people memorized every word in the Bible. And... Uh, and what happened then, after you graduated from Bet Talmud, the, the really the best of the best of the best students wanted to become rabbis, and they would go to a rabbi and they'd say, could I be your disciple? And uh, the, the rabbi would test them, and he'd quiz them, you know, what about this verse, or what about this verse? And when he'd ask him the verse, he'd just say, and what's the verse before it and the verse after it? I mean, you really had to know your stuff. And so, uh, if you measured up, if you were the best of the best of the best, the rabbi might say to you, Come, follow me. And that would be like the best day of your life. That's like getting into Harvard or whatever. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm going somewhere with this because it's amazing that this rabbi Jesus is teaching regular people. Now, in, in Matthew chapter 4, um, it says he's walking beside the Sea of Galilee. Did we, we had a picture of the Sea of Galilee, right? And I just blew right by it. Did you want to see that? There you go. That's, um, it's called a Sea of Galilee. It's, it's a lake. It's a good-sized lake, but it's not, you know, not like a great lake or something like that. And it's covered with these nice little uh, hillsides going up. And so somewhere on a hillside, very similar to that, Jesus gathered all these people and he started teaching them. But the, I want you to understand they're just regular people. So it said um, in chapter 4 that he was walking along beside the uh, Sea of Galilee and he saw Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, and they were uh, working on the fishing boats, and he said, come follow me, and it says they immediately left their boat and followed him. And then he went just a little bit further, and he found James and John, and he called them, and they dropped their nets, and they immediately followed him. And uh, when I read that, I, I used to read that and I'd go, what the heck, how did they just like leave their family business and, and follow Jesus? And then I started to understand the way that Hebrew um, people were educated. 
These guys didn't make the grade. You know why they were fishing? Because they couldn't be rabbis. They went through Bet Sefer, they went through Bet Talmud. They were not the A group. This is not the top of the class. And so when this rabbi comes to them and says, follow me, they're going, me? You want me to follow you? Oh, yeah, I am so in. I've been waiting for this. It's just this beautiful gift. Jesus, the rabbi, comes to people like them, people like you, people like me, regular people. We're not the A-listers. We're not the Dean's listers. We're not the Fortune 500 listers. And he comes to us and he says, follow me. I invite you to follow me. I think that's just tremendous good news. And so what you see now, and as, as Jesus starts to teach, he's teaching regular people just like you and me. Not rabbinic students, but men and women who are just trying to make it. And so he introduces in these three chapters, here's how you live as my people. And I hope you've been watching the whole series. You can listen to it. Uh, Pastor Jason's been teaching. Uh, Pastor Ryan taught about uh, anger and how to live reconciled. Jesus is laying out, here's how to live. And so today he, he teaches two more really, really important concepts I want to draw attention to. He teaches us that if we're going to follow him, if we're going to be salt and light, we need to live with integrity and we need to sacrifice. Those are the two themes today. Jesus is teaching ordinary people, but he is teaching extraordinary things. Extraordinary things like you are the salt that the world needs to survive. You are the light that people in darkness need. That's amazing. And he comes to us now and says, live with integrity and live with sacrifice. Okay, let's dig, dig into the first thing, okay? Matthew 5.33 says, You know your ancestors were told, don't use the Lord's name to make a promise unless you're going to keep it. Don't make vows. I, I tell you not to swear by anything when you make a promise. Heaven is God's throne, so don't swear by heaven. The earth is God's footstool, don't swear by the earth. Jerusalem's the city of the great king, so don't swear by it. Don't swear by your own head. You cannot make one hair white or black. When you make a promise, only say yes or no. So the message here is to live in such a way to be a person who makes promises and keeps promises, you don't need to add extra words. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. You see, the power of a promise isn't found in the words you use. The power of promise is in the person who makes the promise, isn't it? That's where the integrity is. And that's what integrity is, is to keep that promise. And that's where the power is. The power is in the promise maker. You don't need to swear on my mother's grave and, you know, all the stuff that people do. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. That's the issue of integrity and honesty. And, and doesn't that shape the kind of friend you are? Doesn't that shape the kind of employee you are, the kind of employer you are? I know for sure it shapes the kind of husband or wife you are. Cheryl and I uh, do marriage education, and, and everywhere we go, we just teach this. Love and trust are, are, are just bound like this. Love and trust are tied up together. And when we uh, live in such a way with our spouse, we're honest, we're transparent, we grow love. We grow the right environment for love to grow. So if you're a married person, live into your promises. Recommit those promises daily. If you're not a married person, can I say this? Look for somebody who makes and keeps promises. Look for a person who makes and keeps promises. That's a person worth knowing. Um, Cheryl, Cheryl and I, we've been married almost 45 years. And uh, when uh, we were dating, she was going to Trinity. I was teaching high school here in Surrey. And, um, and she told me this story afterwards. See, I, I, I knew I wanted to propose to her, but I was waiting for the magic moment. You know, I, it was just all this pressure. It had to be perfect. And it kept not being perfect. So, I, you know, tonight we're going to get engaged. And, you know, I'd do whatever we arranged. And we had a lovely evening. But I'd never ask her to marry me. And uh, I found this out afterwards that she'd go back to, to uh, Trinity, to the dorms, and uh, talk to her girlfriends. And she was starting to think, this guy can't make a promise. And she's about going, so she told me later, she was about going, yeah, I'm going to have to, like, play me or trade me kind of uh, ultimatum. Uh, because she's concerned, you know, 
I need somebody who can make and keep a promise. And you know what? We all do. And certainly when it comes to marriage, that's the kind of person we should be looking for. And it's the kind of person we should try to be. We shouldn't look for something in somebody else that we're not, right? Be a great promise maker and promise keeper. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. You don't need extra threats. You don't need extra vows. It's a matter of honesty. It's a matter of integrity. And if you're following Jesus, that's enough. Just your yes be yes and your no be no. All right, being men and women of honesty and integrity, of character, that's what it means to follow Jesus. It's part of what it means to be a citizen in this upside-down kingdom. That's tough. That's hard. That's challenging. But the next thing Jesus teaches is crazy. It's crazy. It goes on in Matthew chapter 5. You know you've been taught an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't try to get even with the person who's done something to you. When somebody slaps your right cheek, turn and let that person slap your other cheek. If somebody sues you for your shirt, give up your coat as well. If a soldier forces you to carry his pack for one mile, carry it two miles. When people ask you for something, give it to them. When they want to borrow money, lend it to them. Okay, that... That's a lot there. And as I was reading it and trying to, trying to say, what can we talk about today? I, I think the value that came out of here, the kingdom value in this upside down kingdom is sacrifice. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you can't, you need to sacrifice. There's a couple things we, we're getting called to sacrifice. Sacrifice our rights and sacrifice our possessions. Okay, this is serious stuff. And you know, I, that's probably never easy to sacrifice our rights and our possessions. But I think in North America today, it's crazy. North America is built on radical individual rights and the acquisition of goods, isn't it? I mean, these are the values that undercut North American culture, underlay North American culture. My radical individual rights and uh, possessions, money. So Jesus, first of all, says we need to be prepared to sacrifice our rights. That's this whole, you know, slapped on the one cheek, um, turn the other cheek. Now, this is not an endorsement of uh, violence. This is not an endorsement of violence, 100%, okay? This is not saying that physical um, violence, physical abuse is in any way acceptable. What Jesus is talking about here is, is, is this ancient law that said that there was consequences for actions. And then the eye for eye, tooth for tooth, put a limit on the consequences, right? So it's like, if uh, you borrow my lawnmower and you break it, that doesn't give me a right to burn down your house. Like, that doesn't fit the crime. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth is sort of a way to limit the damage. Yes, there's consequences. Yes, there's um, uh, retribution, rec- uh, compensation, but it matches the crime. Uh, that stops this s- upward spiral of violence that happens, right? Like, I punch you, you stab me, I shoot you. You know, like it just escalates, and that's what happens when we make revenge our goal. So eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth puts a limit on that. But you know what? If we practice that, you still end up with a community of blind, toothless people. Because we still do wrong things. And Jesus is saying, step away from getting even. Give up your right to get even. So you got slapped, you have a right to slap back, don't take it. Give up that right in order to stop the friction, to stop the conflict. But somebody's got to go first, right? And this is what Jesus is calling, and this is uh, calling us to, and that's why it's so radical. And it's so upside down. When you are struck or abused in one way or another, well, I shouldn't say abused. Uh, If you are struck in one way or another, give up your right to get even in order to save, to be a peacemaker. You know, in the Beatitudes, did you read earlier in in, uh, Matthew, there's the Beatitudes, be merciful, be a peacemaker. Um, You know, be this and be that. That's why they're called the Beatitudes. There you go, there's another dad joke. You can put it in your database. Okay, that's all I got. No more coming. So we give up our right to get even. And uh, then it goes on to say, 
Yeah, after we slap one cheek. How about this? Um, if somebody wants to sue you and take your shirt, and I have no idea why they would do that. Why would you sue somebody for their shirt? I said, give up your coat as well. So even if you're correct, even if you could win in court, uh, Jesus is saying, give up your coat in order to save the relationship. So, you know, the command or the teaching's been, give up your right to get even to save the relationship. Give up your coat to save the relationship. You see, in this upside down kingdom, relationships are more important than our rights. Relationships are more important than our rights. Now, that doesn't sit super well in North America, but I think that's what Jesus is teaching here. And that's why this is called an upside down kingdom. All right, he goes on and it says, if a soldier forces you to carry his pack one mile, carry it another mile. Now, you, you need to understand, he's not talking about, you know, where you and I might meet somebody from the armed forces and we might say, hey, you know, thank you for serving our country. You know, can I buy your lunch? Or He's talking about Roman soldiers. This is an occupying army. This is uh, somebody who you don't want in your country, uh, somebody who oppresses you. That's the person who's saying, carry my pack. And there was a law that if a Roman soldier asked you to do that for a mile, you had to do it. And I bet the Roman soldiers could have coming up to them and going, okay, you know, I'm going to ask this guy to carry my pack. And I got my hand on my sword because I might have to use authority to get him to agree to this. And he goes, sure, I'll carry it for two miles, actually. Blows his mind. Blows his mind that, that a guy would do that. I wonder what they would talk about for the two miles. Like, what's wrong with you, man? Usually I have to threaten people to carry my bag and you're volunteering to do it for two miles. What's up with you? And here's the deal. This is what Jesus is teaching. Whenever we live and love beyond reason, we get people curious about this kingdom of Jesus. When we live and love beyond reason, people get curious about what's going on. What's this Jesus story? And that's why Jesus taught that. So he's talking about giving up our rights to save the relationship, um, not fighting for our rights because that maybe will destroy us, uh, destroy the relationship. And then he reaches across 2,000 years, the next thing Jesus teaches. He reaches across cultures, and I think he just punches me right in the gut in my and your acquisitive, possessive, capitalist gut. And he says, if people ask you for something, give it. Man, do you have questions? I mean, I do. Like, why should I? Why can't they get their own? I work for this. Let them work for it. Will I ever get it back? And if I do that for them, what will they do for me? I mean, these are all questions that I think go off pretty quick in my head when, uh, when I read that and Jesus just says, no, no, give it, give to them if they ask of you. See, Jesus would say those are the wrong questions. Jesus said, here's the question. Whose stuff is this anyhow? Where did it come from? Who gave you this stuff that you have? And the answer is, it's all God's blessing. It's all from God. And if everything is from God, then Jesus would say, then you are a steward. And what's your responsibility as a, as a steward then? What should you do? And uh, he goes on to say, you should use what God, God has entrusted to you to bless other people when they're in need. I think that's a teaching that's really clear here. And it just really runs counter to uh, what we live with in North America a lot of times. Now, Jesus goes on in chapter 6 and stick with the, the series. I'm sure, uh, I don't know who's going to teach on it, but he goes on and says, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Uh, the flowers of the field uh, are beautiful and the Lord makes them. And the birds of the air have all that they need to feed. Do not worry. Your heavenly Father knows you need these things. So this is part of the reality, I think, that Jesus is trying to get at. This whole possessiveness that, that makes me first want to acquire and then secondly keep is at some level a lack of trusting God for tomorrow. I can't share that because if I give that away, I won't have it. And God says through Jesus, trust your heavenly Father. He knows you need these things. Be generous. Friends, it's not wrong. It's not wrong to work hard. And uh, it's not wrong to uh, be rewarded uh, and in our culture, you know, with wages or ass assets. It's not wrong to have assets. What Jesus is teaching here is never forget who gave you those assets. And when you can use them 
to advance the kingdom of Jesus, you need to do it in Jesus' name. So if somebody asks something, we give it. You see, it's interesting. You go, well, you know, if God asked me, I'd give it. Here's the interesting thing. God usually asks me and asks you through other people. So, I, you know, I go, yeah, if God showed up right here, of course I'd give, give God anything. But how about if he shows up looking like a homeless person or looking like somebody who uh, just needs food? See, in Matthew 25, uh, Jesus is describing the end of all things. And uh, the Heavenly Father says, God bless you because when I was hungry, you fed me. And when I was naked, you clothed me. And when I was needing shelter, you took me in. And you go, oh, we never saw you. And he said, yeah, you did. As much as you've done it to one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. See, when God asks us for things, he often asks us to lay down our rights or to give away our possessions in the voice of another person through somebody else. That's the kind of kingdom we're called to. And it's kind of crazy, isn't it? A kingdom where we are willing to give up our rights. A kingdom where we are willing to give away what God's stewarded us, uh, given to us as stewards. Like that's an upside down kingdom. That's not typical. That's not what a lot of people would teach, but that's what Jesus taught. And I want to leave you uh, suspended in this message. The whole three chapters are laying out what it's like to live in Jesus' kingdom. Be a person of integrity. Be willing to give up your rights. Be a generous person. Give away your possessions for the sake of others. That's what Jesus has called his disciples to, regular people like you. He goes to ordinary people like you and me, and he asks us to do extraordinary things. But the good news is, he'll help us do it. He'll help us do it. That's what this community is about, to stand with one another. That's what the Word of God's about, to guide us. And that's what the Holy Spirit's about, to give you strength. So I just want to pray over this, uh, that w this would sink down deep into our minds, that it would change the way we think that would transform the way we think about our world, our rights, our possessions, and change us a little bit more into Jesus, okay? God in heaven, so amazing that you did not leave us in the dark, but you came, light of the world, and you shone the light of truth on our, on our lives. Thank you for the teaching that uh, we find in your word, for the Sermon on the Mount. I pray that you would cause each one of us to sink deep into these chapters and find you there, to find your teaching there. And would you make us humble and uh, take the teaching into our hearts? Even when it's challenging, help us to take it deep into our hearts and live it out so the whole world would see us and through us, see you, Jesus. Thank you for these good people. Go with us today and throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen.